Welcome back to Guitar Summit Web Camp 2020. I hope you're all enjoying the show so far. I know I am. My name is Richard Morgan, and you might know me as the marketing guy from Blue Guitar here in Germany. You might also know me from the Rich Words Music YouTube channel. But today I have been given the privilege to spend some time with the one and only Mr. Trevor Wilkinson. Trev? Hi there. How are you, How doing? Are you doing? Ray, great to be here. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to have you on here. It's great to have you here as part of the Guitar Summit live stream as well. I do want to warn people watching now, this is part of the live Guitar Summit stream, okay? So we're probably going to be cut to about 30 minutes on this. Trev will probably talk for longer than 30 minutes because he has a lot of stories. So if we go over and we get cut off, there's going to be a little link down below on the website somewhere where you can click to watch the whole rest of the interview, okay? I'll try not right. to go too long. Please do, because we've all got things to do. But let's get right into it then. And let's just imagine that 2020 wasn't like it is and we were able to do the Guitar Summit. What would you have been doing had you been in Mannheim for this event? Um, well, last year was the first time we did the Guitar Summit and it was absolutely fantastic. So it's, it's a tragedy that we can't do it again this year, but this is the best that we can do. So I'm sure that this will work very, very, very well. We, we had a, a fantastic summit last year and we were looking forward to this year. So basically we used last year at, at, at Mannheim to actually um, introduce quite a lot of new products for us. Um, and we're continuing with that now as we, uh, we continue with our, with our business. We've had a very good year's business, to be quite honest with you, Richard. I don't know what yours has been like. I'm sure it's been good with Thomas. Yeah. Um, we've, we've had a great year, but it's not been easy um, with uh, COVID-19 and what have you. And uh, unfortunately, Guitar Summit's become a victim of it. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk you through some of the products that we would have had there at, at, at Mannheim, and hopefully that will help the people know a little bit about Wilkinson and what we're continuing to do. Yeah, and I believe you've got some of the products right there in front of you on, on the table, have you? Yes, I didn't quite know where the conversation was going to go, so I've kind of like prepared like one of nearly, <laughs> one of nearly everything that we would have had on a bigger display at, at Guitar Summit. And, yeah. and I know we're going to be talking with Thomas about the WVS 54, which is the absolute um, replica of a 54 Stratocaster bridge. But um, we were, we've been putting a website together for Wilkinson. We've never really had a website before. And in the research and in the, in, in the, in the process of putting the website together, um, it sounds crazy this, but it, it reminded us or it, it, it came to our attention that we have had our Wilkinson VS100 bridge, which everybody will recognize. This is yeah. now 30 years old. 30 years. 30 years. Wow. This, ma this makes me sound okay. even older than what I am. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, it, it's incredible when you, th when you think about it, that this, you know, if, if I'm allowed to say this, is, has become a standard of the industry. Um, obviously, you know, the, the industry was started by good old Leo. If, if we take Paul Bigsby out of the equation, which is still massive today, but the, the real vibrato that everybody gets on with is really the WVS54, which is this, is or the Fender Bridge. And then, yeah. since then, everybody's been trying to improve. Not just me, but also Leo Fender himself. And I was very privileged to spend quite a lot of time with Leo be before his untimely death. Um, and um, he was on the same kind of track. He was trying to... He knew what he'd done in the 50s, and he was still trying to improve right up until the day that, that he died at GNL, making better bridges, making better guitars, and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he used to ask me, why are you doing this? Why are you in the industry? And, I, and I, I said to him one day, Leo, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be in this industry. And all I'm trying to do is make, make a better mousetrap. And, you know, you, Leo himself was aware of the pitfalls and, and the, the, the um, drawbacks of, of the original bridge. Um, and I was on the same tracks trying to actually take that concept, which is so hard to make better apart from the functionality of it. Um, yeah. And that's what created this VS100 bridge, which, as I say, is now 30 years old. So it, it's incredible that it's still relevant. Um, what, what are you going to choose if you're building a guitar? You're going to choose a vintage Fender, you may go down the Floyd Rose route, or you may go down the Wilkerson VS100. And everything else is just a version of, of everything else. But I think... It, it, I'm reminded every day that this was actually quite a revolutionary bridge and it's still incredibly popular. Sales of this are going up all the time, which is incredible. 
So I'm very, very blessed. Yeah, absolutely. And Wilkinson Hardware, the name Wilkinson is all over all sorts of guitars from pretty much every budget end of the spectrum, right? Yes, we, we've, we've got a, mass, a massive range of product, which is making the website very difficult to put together um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's like what, you know, and, and we want the website there is for a lot of information because there is so much Wilkinson products in the marketplace that we want to be able to give people information on whatever price point, whatever style they're looking for. Let's try and do this with as much information as we can so people can make the right buying decision, basically. Yeah, sure, because I, I obviously know you pretty well. We worked together at JHS for a couple of years. I had the pleasure of working with you on vintage guitars and Fret King and stuff. So I've always known Wilkinson as being part of other brands in a way. Yeah. Or like a, a specialist niche product that household name brands would call upon when they needed something. What I'd never really thought of was Wilkinson as its own entity, uh, Trev Wilkinson as his own name. But that's what you're trying to do now, isn't it? Establish that under your own sort of a banner. Correct, correct, yeah. We're, we're just trying yeah. to show people what we do. Um, how we've worked hard over the last 35 years, um, trying to, basically trying to work with the guitar player, trying to work for the guitar player. I've always, I've always felt it was very, very important um, to actually give the guitar player what he really, really needed. When, when he's on stage performing, he's far too busy to worry about whether his bridge is gonna come back into tune or whether he's, all those things that you, that you don't need to think about when you're on stage because you're performing. And it's always been, I felt it was always my mission and my, my job to give the guitar player the best possible hardware, pickups, tuners, whatever, um, to make his job easier. And do it, do it for the guitar player. Don't do it because you sat around a marketing table um, <laughs> deciding on what product you're going to try and shove down the industry that year to actually do something, again, you know, with, with longevity that actually works. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And you would know that going all the way back because you started out as a young guitar player, right? Very, very bad one. Well, we're in the same boat there, so I, I feel you. I <laughs> which is why, that which is why I do, Which is why I do what I do. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, we all started off. I mean, I was incredibly privileged to be being brought up in the 60s, which was a fantastic time. Um, and it was, it was exciting, it, it, it was groundbreaking, and uh, I don't think we'll ever see a time like that again. Mm. But, but after, after saying that, I think today's times are absolutely incredible because this is, this is the first time probably since maybe Strauss or, or something like that, where you actually go to a gig and you can see grandfathers and fathers and sons watching the same band. And this, this, is, this, is watching, this is watching rock and roll that was supposed to die in 1964. And, and it's still current today. It's incredible how this music has lasted and has had dips and swerves and whatever you want to call them, but it's never really, really changed. And when you do trade shows, like we do Guitar Summit, you'll see young kids come up and they'll pick the guitar up and they'll play something. And I'll say to them, you didn't even hear that on your father's um, album collection. This was your grandfather's album collection. This is John Mayall. This is Peter Green. And they go, oh, yeah, it's great. It's great. And, and so it's, it's incredible music, uh, incredible industry to be in. Do you ever worry about, we're going off topic slightly here, but do you ever worry about young guitar heroes coming through or the lack of? Or do you think that young guitar players will always go back to the, to the greats, to the Beatles and ACDC and the Stones and that kind of stuff? I, I think it's very, very difficult not to go not to go back because nearly every even if we go forward, I mean, there's lots of guitar heroes in the industry today that don't. I, I have to say, I don't always recognise their names as as you would recognise Stevie Ray Vaughan or or something like that. But the yeah. funny thing is, is everybody tends to gravitate back to that period to to that time, um, and and that's that's what's great about the industry, and that's what that's what's amazing about this is what we've got here are quite small incremental improvements in what we started with but we're still very very retro um even though you know there are many people doing some great things with um with different um different different guitars different styles and all those kind of things but you know only just only just recently um we we had a, a message in from um Yvette who is now uh, an Ibanez endorsee and she's using a, a Wilkinson bridge you know Oh yeah, which, mm -hmm. which which is fantastic. So hey, there's a there's a real real young groundbreaking player player, um, and away we go. 
she's still is that she, um is that event young it is yes yeah oh wow yeah okay yeah so there's Yvette Young, groundbreaking, and she's still playing our version of a vintage-style vibrato because, yeah. it, because it works. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. So who were the players and what were the instruments that inspired a young Trev to first get into this business of guitars and hardware? Hank Marvin. Mm -hmm. um, because Hank Marvin in the shadows, it was like... Yeah. It was it was great. It, it was it was exciting, and he, he used the vibrato to to great effect, um, and that that got me into it. And uh, in those days, I couldn't even afford. You couldn't even buy a Stratocaster in those days in in the UK, which is why there was this massive influx of European guitars, which I am still fascinated by today. Mm. The way that that people in Europe were building guitars to mimic the Strats, even though they'd never seen them. Some of the guitars that were made, even in the late 50s, they, they, were, they, were, they were almost made on a description over the telephone. <laughs> when, you know, I've got a lot of these in my, in my collection. I have this guitar collection, which I say is an example of what not to do mostly. <laughs> but, but it was fantastic how people were putting these guitars together and I was trying to learn on them. And these things, you know, you could drive a bus under the, the action. We, you, you know, kids today are so, so fortunate in that they can go literally. I mean, I don't believe truly anybody really makes a bad guitar. The, 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 no, I don't think they do in 2020, no. No, I think nearly every guitar that's produced, no matter what price point it is, with somebody who knows what he's doing, 15 minutes on a bench, you could give it to a professional guitar player to play it on stage. But then we progress from that, don't we? Because we always want to improve. I always say guitar players are like golfers. Golfers think mm -hmm. they've got a bigger bag of bats, they're gonna play better. So guitar players obviously go into gear. I need that pickup. I need that pickup. I need that bridge. I need those tuners. I need that guitar. Yeah. And it's, that's what keeps our industry going. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, that, that's why we're all at the Guitar Summit after all. You yeah. got it. You got it. Yeah. So what was the first guitar that you built then? I built a guitar when I was at art college in 1966, which mm -hmm. was a Telecaster style guitar made out of okay. some parts from old Hofners and um, Grazioso uh, Future Armors and things that I made myself like a fluorescent orange Telecaster shaped body in plexiglass. Fluorescent orange plexiglass, okay. That's, that fluorescent orange plexiglass, yeah. <laughs> Sounded terrible but looked great when it was glowing under lights. Are there any pictures or footage of that guitar? Does it um, still exist? I, I, I will ask one of my colleagues here to have a look through my little store and he may just find um, a box that says Plexi Guitar Body. And if he can find it, which is... Come down here, Rick. Sorry, excuse me. I'm just going to have to direct to this shelf down here. And there is a box there. I think it says Plexi Caster on it. And, and it, you know, if we've got time, we'll talk, we'll talk about other things. But while we find that, I'll just show you I've just got the body left in a few little bits and pieces. Something I keep meaning to put back together again if I can find all the bits. But that's 1966. Yeah, that would be amazing. 1966. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? 1966. What is that? 50. Don't, rem don't remind years me. Ago. Don't remind me. Yeah. Don't remind wow. me. And that, okay. that has got. It, you know, it had. A, I've still got the vibrato system, which came off a 58 um, Grazioso Future Armor guitar. <laughs> um, and and it, it's just unbelievable um, what what it what it actually is. Um, yeah. In fact, here it comes now. So, and it weighs a ton. <laughs> it weighs an absolute ton. And maybe we can show. I it love that orange. You like? Look at that edge glowing. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's actually it made. Looks, it looks like a telly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's well. You know, I was. You know, one of, one of my guitar heroes, obviously, is Jeff Beck playing in the Yardbirds. Yeah. So Telly was the guitar to go to. It's inch and a half thick, and it's made uh -huh. out of eight-inch pieces of plexiglass glued together. Wow. So one day we'll put this back together again, and it'll go, it'll go in the museum. Yeah, you have to. That's I'm, I'm going to hand it back right now because it's too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> So yeah, that was, yeah 19, that was 1960, 1966. It was on display at the art college in Southport. Yeah. 
And after that, did you realize then that this was something that you wanted to do? Was it a calling or did you want to become a successful person in the industry? How did you go on from there? No, I, I kind of was playing in bands at the time and then I just fell into um, repairing cars, buying and selling cars and repairing cars. And I did that mm -hmm. for a long, long time until I uh, moved to Australia in 1980. And that was when I um, invented um, the Wilkinson Roller Nut because yeah. I, I decided that I was tired of doing cars and I would like to build guitars for a living. So I started to build guitars, repair guitars, and people were bringing things like the early Floyd Roses, pre-fine-tuning Floyd Roses, um, to me to put on beautiful 62 strats. <laughs> Absolutely kill them. But, of course, everybody wanted to be Eddie Van Halen. Yep. And so it was actually doing all this with, with the early Floyds, pre-fine-tuning, as I say, going, hang on a minute, there's got to be a better way of doing this. This is, I understand what Floyd's doing with this, but there's got to be a better way for the guy that doesn't want to do this. Um, and that's when I, I, I invented the roller nut, which uh, eventually took me to California in 1984, where I started to produce it. And then in the late 80s, 19, uh, about 87, 88, it became a standard fitment on the Fender Strat Plus. Yeah, that would have been, that was what was in my head there. And that was a moment when you became widely known throughout the industry, when Fender put you on the 87 yep. Strat Pluses with the roller bridge, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, with, and, and, had, and, had, which, which Jeff Beck is still using to today. Yeah. He, he, he really, really is. Thank you. And that's it. That's, that is the original, what they call a split Wilkinson rolling up. And were you in any way in competition with the Floyd Rose Bridge and the Floyd Rose team, or was it more just like you know a bit of healthy competition? You just wanted to see something. I, I think I think we were the alter nice. I think we were the alternatives. Yeah, we were, we were the alternatives. Um, you could say you're in competition because you're you're trying to sell parts to the same guitar companies. But as we see today, there's still guitar companies that feature Floyd Roses in their range and guitar companies that feature Wilkinson in their range, and they're for two different styles because the Floyd created a different style of playing. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it was, it was friendly competition, if you like, but we were, we were really, really the alternatives. But with, this, yeah, with, sure. the, with, the, success, with the success of the, um, of the, of the roller nut, that, that got me uh, introduced to many, many guitar players around the LA area. And um, one of the guys who was really, really helpful to me and very instrumental in getting me to do the VS100 um, was Scott Henderson. Mm -hmm. And Scott Henderson became an endorsee C and used the VS100 on his Ibanezes for a long time. And he's now uh, with John Sir, but he's back playing sort of like vintage style um, guitars from, from John Sir. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, 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 been, it, it's, been, it's been a great journey. And, and um, after 30 years, um, I, I get a call from John Sir who, who says to me, well, Trev, We've known each other for a long, long time, but I'm still having a problem keeping my guitars in tune. Surely you've got an answer. And about 25 years ago, I invented a saddle um, to actually clamp the string at the intonation point. I never released it because Wilkinson was the guy that said, you don't need to use a wrench. You don't need to use a wrench. Mm. But it was John Sir that brought it home to me that even though we'd done everything with um, stagger drilling, which is where you drill a block with holes staggered so they follow the intonation line, this really, 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 really helps. But at the time, that, at the time we're in now, everybody's still talking about a bridge that has shallow drill blocks with the six in line. It's maybe not the right way to do it for some things, but I'm not going to fight it. So... I looked at it and went, okay, I've got these saddles. I sent a set to John Sir. Um, he put the bridge on a guitar and he came back to me and he said, it's fantastic. And he says, I'm going to put it on Pete Thorne's guitar. And Pete Thorne went out and played it for about nine months and came back and said, it's the answer. And so that's now featured on the Pete Thorne model, John Sir. And it's going on several other guitars now. We've got a lot of companies interested in it. Sales of it are absolutely fantastic. We are selling it on WilkinsonReverb.com um, reverb shop. Um, we can't keep the bridges in stock. We can't keep the saddles in stock. 
and, and that basically is what we call a VS-132P. Mm -hmm. So that is now... This, this is now the natural progression from this to this. Yeah. So. And how many years did it take you to make that progression? Um, the saddles, as I say, about 25 years ago, but really, reality mm -hmm. is, it's probably 30 years, because it's like, this still works fine, lots of people still use this, this is great, but this just addresses that extra little need that some people have, and um, it's been... It, it's been an eye opener for me. It's absolutely incredible that you can you can almost start again thirty years later. You know. Yeah. Well, actually, the Pete Thorne thing takes me back to a, a question that I'd actually written earlier, and it was that um, I wanted to use his signature guitar as an example of a very high end instrument that uses Wilkinson hardware, because some people, rightly or wrongly, often associate Wilkinson with brands like Vintage because yeah. you're so tightly tied to them, or yeah. you were up yeah. until a couple of years ago. But your hardware is also used on these high-end American-made instruments, like the Pete Thorne one, and he speaks very highly of it. I've seen him on numerous YouTube events and stuff like that. He raves about that guitar. Yeah, and it, it's fantastic. It's selling extremely well, it's and it's got a Wilkinson on it. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like everything else. Th things can be made available at various price points. Now, with, with Vintage, mm. and you were very heavily involved with Vintage, as I was, um, and I think we proved that you know, you don't necessarily have to pay a fortune for a guitar to get a good working guitar. It's whether somebody's yep. willing to put the work into it at the lower price points. And generally speaking, all the parts to make a bridge are available all around the world. Mm. Steel is steel. Stainless steel is stainless steel. Brass is brass. It's just knowing how to make something, and we said this in vintage in our days when we were together there, it's building something from the inside out. Not necessarily just making a replica or just going, oh, that looks like it, that'll work. Yeah. I know places where you can buy a vibrato bridge for $1.90. I wouldn't want to use it. And it's what you put mm. into it and the money that you put into it or the expertise you put into it that, that's allowed us to be able to supply hardware at many, many different price points. Many, many different price points. You've heard me say this. If you, if you can't make a good guitar for 3,000 euros, you shouldn't be doing it. It's making a good guitar for 300 euros that matters. But the 3,000 yep. euro guitar has got the time spent on it to give it the finesse. And that's what you get. That's what you get with that kind of guitar. And that's what goes into the VS 132P. It's the finesse of the heat treating, the correct... Um, saddle shape, the correct steels, all those things. It's not a cheap piece. It's an expensive piece. So it deserves to be on an expensive guitar. Yep, yep absolutely. absolutely. Uh, cold rolled steel. Tell me about the importance of that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, that cold rolled steel, because um, obviously we've got our anniversary series uh, Telecaster Bridges. And mm. I saw a little while ago of a company advertising the fact that um, they made their top plates out of cold rolled steel the reality is is you can't stamp anything but cold rolled steel <laughs> so you know it's a big selling point for them but I've, I've never even thought about mentioning it but no all our telly bridges have always been cold rolled steel there are some people that will make a telly bridge out of brass which is fine i ain't got a problem with that but there is one thing that i think um our, our customers and, and everybody needs to know and it's it's how do you get to that classic sound how do you get to why a guitar sounds that way it does. Now, again, I've said this many times, you'll never get me to tell you something sounds better than something because the difference in sound is purely subjective from one yeah. set of ears to another. So I'm not gonna tell you that if you've got a telly with a brass bridge on, it's gonna sound bad, because it's not. Because it never sounded bad when Townsend played it, it never sounded bad when Dire Straits, Mark Knopfler played it. So consequently, that's, that's rubbish. But if you want the true sound of a telly, if you think about this, if we take a, a Telecaster pickup, which is this one of our WVOBs, which is a 50s replica, on the bottom of that is a copper-plated steel plate. Mm. Now then, the magnets are going through the coil and they are contacting that copper steel plate. So when they contact that, then the three screws that are going through that copper steel plate, which connect to the three holes that are in that bridge, now transfer that magnetic field to the whole bridge. What does that do? Just creates a mag massive magnetic field. It's got to make a difference to the sound. 
And if you haven't got a coal roll steel plate, and you haven't got that plate on the bottom of a telly, I'm not saying the guitar's going to sound bad, I'm just not going to say it's going to sound like you expect it to sound if you listen to a 52 Esquire. Yeah. yeah. So it's all those little, little bits of attention to detail that um, I think, you know, actually separates us probably from a lot of our competitors where we really, really, really do go to that extra length to give you what you expect. We'd like to think that what we give you does what it says on the box. Yeah, absolutely. You, to, just to go back then, you said that you moved to America in the mid-80s. I guess 84. that was around the time you met Leo Fender. I think I met and... Leo Fender the, the year after, about 1985. I was trying to think how I ended up being introduced to him. And I've got a feeling that I went with a guitar player friend of mine and then met John Jorgensen there and um, Leo. And um, we became kind of like friendly, if, if you like. Leo, Leo looked at the rolling up and smiled and said, oh, yeah, I see what you're doing here, and, and that's really, really good. And uh, slowly the friendship grew, and I uh, used to do work with him. I uh, used to build parts for him, used to visit with him at G&L. And a, a rapport um, just kind of grew between us. You must remember that Leo suffered tragically from Parkinson's disease. So mm. his, his communication wasn't always that good. He was very conscious of that. So he, didn't, he, was, a, he was a man of few words. But he had all the answers. Any question I wanted to ask him about what he did in the 50s and the 60s and why he did it, he just was very free with that information. He'd just tell me. Everybody was always obsessed with going to see Leo to write books about him and all the kind of history. I was interested in why he did and what he did and why he did it. And that information that I gleaned from Leo has been absolutely phenomenal. It, it, it's... it's, it's um, it still motivates me to, 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 to this day. It's incredible what he did and why he did it. And that mystique of those guitars is still with us today. And yet they're so simple in their essence. Incredibly simple because that's what he wanted to be. Leo Fender was a productionist. He loved making things and he loved making things as simple and as cheaply as he possibly could. So, you know, it, 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 was, a, it was a great thing that he did. All, all the reasons he made the strat, you know, the strap was only an inch and three-quarter thick because he bought two-inch raw older and machined it down mm. and he ended up with one and three-quarter inches. And then everything was made with two depths off a pin router so he could really whiz the body through. Everything was done for a production reason, but somehow he put this thing together, which is absolutely incredible to this day. And we're still trying to yes, make I it he, better. He got it right first time, didn't he? He got, it, was, he got, it, pretty, he got it pretty damn close. And what he didn't get right, we've accepted and even, you know, we, we've actually used it sometimes. If you, if you think about, you've got a big image of Hendrix behind you there. So you think about him playing a right-handed guitar, left-handed. The pickups are in the wrong stagger. The pickups are at the wrong angle at the bridge. All the tension is different because he's got a right-handed peg on the left-handed playing guitar. All those things that you've got is just parts of the faults that he was playing that created a unique sound. Yeah. yeah. You've told a lot of stories over the years about your time with Leo, and I think we all know them, but what would you say are maybe one or two of the main things that you learned from him and influenced your future output with? I think just, I think just, just being inspired by the fact that he was still trying to make a better guitar. You know, he, he used to say to me, why do people like my old guitars? Why do they want to play a 62 Strat? The guitars I'm making at G&L are so much better. And I used to say, yeah, with respect, Leo, they probably are, but you have to face it. You've got it pretty damn close to right at the beginning, and that's what we're still chasing. And we can still make music today on that style of guitar. So it was difficult yeah. for him because, he, he, as I say, he was really, really trying to move things forward. So that's all I've tried to do is, is continue to move things forward, to look backwards, to look at it and go, right, I see what that is. I see how that was done. How can we bring that into 2020? And so help the guitar player to, if he wants that sound, he can get that sound. He wants that feel, he can get that feel. But how can we make his life simple by you know, keeping him in tune or giving him more consistency? And then putting all those products onto all these guitars at all these different price points, from $250 right the way through to $10,000. Mm. And they work in every, in every genre and, and every price point. So you learned a lot from Leo Fender over the years, but one other thing that... I've always been very interested in is Wilkinson pickups. 
And I think some people don't think of you so much as being a pickup person, as being a hardware person. But you've also had a, or you had a good relationship with one Seth Lover, right? Yeah, it wasn't a massive long relationship with Seth, but it was a very, very interesting um, um, couple of meetings, if you like. I, I had bought um, a winding machine, which I saw, um, I bought it second hand, and I looked at it and I thought, this looks really like the pictures I've seen of the winding machine that Gibson used to make the PAFs and make their pickups in the, mm. in the 50s. Um, and so I bought the machine. And a friend of mine who, who was working for me at the time found a guy down at Santa Ana Swap Meet selling tubes and bits of old radios and all kinds of things. And it turns out to be Seth Lover. So he's obviously, he's retired now from, he's re obviously moved from Gibson to Fender, retired from Fender, and was just amusing himself by building old radios and things and selling parts at the swap meets. And um, uh, this friend of mine told him that, that I had this machine and he said, wow, I would love to see that machine. And so I said, well, I'd like him to see the machine because I'd like to know whether it is the machine that was made. And because we'd made inroads now into selling hardware to many, many, many American companies and, and many people around the world, um, I just thought, well, there's obviously a need for somebody to build good quality hardware. Um, I'm sure people would like to be able to buy good quality, affordable pickups made in America mm -hmm. or whatever. So that became like another arm to the business. Okay, well, why can't, why can't I make pickups? You know, Leo told me about how he used to wind the single coils and what he used and all those kind of things. And here I have now this opportunity to speak to the inventor of the, the, the humbucking pickup. Um, and so he, he, he visited with me at, at, at the workshops and sure enough, he said, yep, that's one of the machines that we used. Um, and I said, well, this is, this is a massive machine. This is sort of, th th this is too big. This is an armature winding machine. This is not a pickup winding machine. Oh yeah, he said, well, we adapted it. We used to wind six coils at a time. And he told me the whole, the whole history of, of the fact that, you know, he, he was tasked with making a pickup that Les Paul wanted. And um, Les Paul was a single coil guy but he didn't like the noise. Mm. So what he was always looking for was a single coil, um, single coil sound, but no noise. So Seth set about trying to create this hum cancelling pickup. And he did it with a side-by-side -side coil, um, which we now know is the, 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 the classic humbucker, um, thinking that he'd got the answer for um, Les. Um, but when Les heard it, he didn't like it. It wasn't the sound he had in his head. Mm -hmm. So Les did a completely different thing and he went down the low impedance route. So I was very fortunate to, to meet Les just before he died, which would be 60 years ago now. Um, because yes, it was my 60th birthday, so it was like 61 years ago. Um, um, and I said to him, as, uh, he, he was very gracious and we had a chat about hardware and bits and pieces and all those kind of things. And as, as I was leaving him, I said, Les, I said, there's one, one thing that really strikes me about this. I said, since 1956 or 1955, you actually haven't really played a Les Paul. And he, and he looked at me and I thought, he's going to get upset here. And he, he actually said, what do you mean? I said, well, the last Les Paul really that you played was sort of like 55 with P90s on it, single coils. And the guitar I'm watching you play tonight, because this, this was at the Iridium Club in New York. The guitar I'm watching you play tonight doesn't have humbuckers on it. And it's only the shape of a Les Paul, because it's not even got a carved top. It's got a pick guard on it. It's got all kinds of switches and knobs on it. I said, I've never actually seen you play what we consider to be a Les Paul. And he thought about it for a little while and he went, you're right. Which is really hilarious when you think about it. The fact that this guy has put his name on this guitar and all these guitars have been selling all over the years. Um, yeah, yeah he, he, you know, he knew, he knew what he's doing. He knew, he knew what he wanted. And um, what's brought it home to me is, is you, you asked about pickups. And we, we are releasing this, this range of R-series pickups, which um, people ask me, what does the R mean? And I went, it can mean anything you want it. But as far as I'm concerned, it means real. That's exactly what it means. So before Seth Lover left the office and, and, and the workshop for the first meeting. All I said to him was, tell me how to make a real humbucking pickup. Tell me what mm -hmm. he need to do 
to make a real home booking pickup. So he told me and I wrote it all down. And that's what we've got here. This is a WVC R series home booking pickup in the new series. And it's exactly what Seth told me to do. The wines are what he told me to do. The wire is what he told me to do. The nickel silver cover, the nickel silver base plate, all the things that actually do make a real PAF. And uh, we've, we've put this together. And what it actually tells us is that when you listen to a real 5859, you actually hear nearly a Telecaster. You don't mm. hear what people think is a Les Paul. People have got this, this, this image in their mind of what a Les Paul sounds like. It's not until you actually hear a real 59 or a real 58, a real 60, that actually tells you, well, those pickups don't sound the way I expect them to sound. And they really, really do sound almost, almost like a, te a telly. They're very clean, they're very clear. Um, but the one thing that, that they will do that sometimes a single coil won't do for a Strat is they won't push the front end of an amp. They just won't push it over the top. And that's what they mm. do. And that's where people think the sound, they think what a PAF sound is. But it's actually not the actual sound of the pickup when you just make it pure. So it's all these little bits of research as we've been going into the pickup thing that have, that, that have taught, taught us what, what, the, what the real thing is. You know, and, so and you, 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 you've had the Seth Lover recipe then, but has there also been a, a big aspect of experimentation on your side to kind of perfect it, to make it even better? No, um, just make it no. the same. Just, just, just make it sound what people expect. We, yeah, we, we could do different versions of it, and we have different versions of it. Um, but if you want to put something together that actually has that, that sound that you're looking for, um, we've, we've, we've got it. And then we've got other things as well, and that including in the single coils and everything else. So it's quite, quite exciting. It's been, it's been great going through the testing process of like winding what you think is right and all these different things. So we've got quite a, quite a nice range of R-series pickups going together, which obviously we would have loved to have been in Guitar Summit to, um, to <laughs> demonstrate to everybody. So the best we can do is talk about it. Yeah, sure, absolutely, yeah. So you've got the hardware then, you've got the pickups, you've basically got everything to build a guitar, but the wooden parts there. And I know you've been involved very deeply with many guitar companies, but have you never wanted to have a guitar with Wilkinson on the headstock, a Wilkinson Guitars right. brand. Um, and I'm, tr I'm trying not to count Fret King as that, but maybe you'll say Fret King yeah. is exactly no, that. I know, I know, I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah, I, I, I've said to many people many, many times, there's got to be, there's got to be a Wilkinson guitar in, inside me. But I, again, with what we've done with hardware, what we're doing with pickups, if I do do a Wilkinson guitar, I want it to be, I want it to have a reason to exist. I'm a firm believer that things should have a reason to exist, not just draw around the Strat body and go, oh, look, I've made a Strat. If yeah. you're going to make a guitar, it has to have a reason to exist. So I was very fortunate a few years ago to, to be asked to consult for a, a guitar building factory um, in India, of all places. It's mm -hmm. the only guitar factory in India of note. Um, and I was impressed so much with what they they built and they asked me to consult with them to help them with their product development and their customers and everything. And I said, well, I'd like to do this. And I said, I would like to actually build some guitar parts and put them out as a guitar kit maybe, rather than mm -hmm. just make a Wilkerson guitar, which is a copy of a Strat, a copy of a Les Paul or a Echo of whatever guitars it is. So actually make these parts. And um, they said, okay, if you want to do that, we'd, we'd, we'd like to do that. So I started to research the, the kit market and um, there is a million kits available. There's a million kits available. Some as, some as cheap as 75 euros. Yeah. Again, you only get what you pay for. Um, and again, if you're gonna build a really, really serious guitar, the kit has to be serious. So we looked at it and I went, okay, this is what I learned with Leo. And um, the heart of any guitar, I think anybody would, 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 would agree with, is, is probably the neck. Yeah. And, and this is basically a 22 fret modern version of a bolt on neck with a six aside. We do it with a paddle headstock. We don't have a Fender license. 
you can make mm -hmm. whatever headstock you need. And I want this because I want people to create their own headstock. I want people to create their own identity. I don't want them yeah. slavishly to copy Fender or copy Gibson or what have you. No, let's, let's be original. You can't do a lot about this. You, you need this to keep in tune. Yeah. And, and this line here is generic. It's this line here that's different. So make yeah. it different. Put your own identity on it. But the key to making these necks, and, and um, with knowing Thomas the way I know Thomas and his old 61 Strat and all the things that Thomas and I talk about when we get together, we managed to incorporate this into the, into the kits and produce something that when you've put this guitar together, you have a serious guitar. You can finish it how you want, you can paint it how you want. All the, all the bodies are two-piece, centre joint older. This is a modern version so it can be fitted with any kind of pickups you want. Then on top of that, I wanted to give good quality pickups and everything so that, again, I was seeing people put kits together and they were paying maybe $200 for a kit. And they were putting it together and then they were going, okay, I put this guitar together, it's not quite what I really think it should be. So I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna buy some better tuners, I'm gonna buy some better pickups, I'm gonna buy a better bridge, maybe a Wilkinson bridge, maybe a Fender bridge, what have you. And they end up spending like another five or $600 on parts. Now this is great for our industry, it's good for me because they may have bought one of my bridges or some of my pickups. But now what have they got? They got $900 in a guitar that actually isn't a $900 guitar. Mm. It'll still play. So I said, okay, so let's do, look at some Platinum Series pickups. Let's do the standard industry CTS pots, CRL switch all the gear that you need, all the buzzwords that we have in our industry. Let's put all this together in a kit. And they have sold like crazy. It's been incredible. Mm -hmm. The success has just been amazing. And these things sell for sort of like, you know, 400 pounds, 400 euros. But you can really put a serious guitar together. Yeah, like you say, it's a lot more than you would pay if you're going for a budget kit, but if you really want to have something decent at the end of it, you've got to put the money in, haven't you? Exactly, exactly. And yeah. I, I don't see the point in, in putting $500 into a $200 kit when you can buy a, guitar, a kit for less than that and get everything that you actually need. Yeah. So why not build a serious guitar? So it's been fun. Yeah, exactly. It's been a real, real fun project. We've got, we've got you know... T-style guitars, S-style guitars, and all those kind of things, and um, they're, 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 they're available. Um, they're available from Stu Mac in the, in the US, they're available from Scan here in the UK, and mm -hmm. uh, we've got several people talking to us from Europe and around the world who would like to carry those kits as well as carry all the works and hardware, so it's great. It, 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 it never stops. There's always something new to do.